Welcome to the last session of your day. We hope this is a fun one for you. Uh, we're going to be talking about FIPI's Field Guide to WASM. Uh, I'm Matt Butcher. I'm the CEO of Fermion. Uh, we started Fermion um, in late 2021, and the very we were kind of in that stealth mode for a while. And the very first time we ever, you know, got a booth together and got up on stage and talked about it was at Open Source Summit a couple of years ago. So it's fun to be here again, like a couple of years back, and do something that's just fun. I thought of something when we. So I'll, I'll, I'll mention it later, but we did. Um, Fippy goes to the zoo in Seattle. That's right. That's right. We were yeah so. when the, for when KubeCon was here. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, so since our since our theme here is uh, is sort of like field guide camping oriented, we figured we each share a story about camping. So uh, mine is uh, my dad and I went camping. My dad was in his tent over there. I was in my tent over here, and uh, I woke up at two three in the morning, and my dad was rummaging around in the food, and I'm like, Dad, go to bed. And still rummaging around in the food. I'm like, Dad, go to bed. Still rummaging around. I'm like, yeah, maybe he's sleepwalking. So I go and unzip the tent, you know, walk out, and there's a bear right there. <laughs> uh, and I was like, you are not my father. Uh, <laughs> you, can, you can have the marshmallows. And I sat in my tent awake for the rest of the night, and uh, we didn't have any marshmallows the next day. You kind of jumped into your story. Do you want to say who you are? <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I'm Matt Butcher. Um, uh, you know, I've been in the cloud world for a very long time. Uh, back in OpenStack days, I worked at HP on OpenStack. I did a whole bunch of work on Helm. I created a package manager. Uh, did a whole bunch of work on Kubernetes, created the package manager called Helm. Uh, Karen will talk about some of the other interesting things that the two of us have done together over time. And then, yeah, yeah right now, it's all, all WebAssembly all the time for me. Yeah. Um, so hi, I'm Karen. I also work with Matt at Fermion, and I'm our head of community. Um, I'm supposed to talk. Oh, sorry. I'm supposed to talk about other stuff we've done. Sure. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. I'll talk about the other books we've done later. Um, but yeah, we've been working together for quite a while now. It's been like since 2015. Yep. Um, and my random camping story that isn't as exciting is um, during the pandemic, I happened to get a camping site in Marin County, which is north of San Francisco. Um, and so I actually brought my sourdough starter, its name is Bert, uh, camping with us because the whole idea is um, I follow this like natural fermentation influencer guy on Instagram. And he was saying you should bring your sourdough starter to different places with you so that it can kind of pick up the local microbes in the air and you can add to the, like, the, you know, the flavors of your sourdough. So that is one little fun memory of mine from camping. So, you're, wait, so your sourdough starter's name is Bert. Yes. Is it like flowers where if you talk to them, your sourdough starter gets better too? Do you like talk to Bert? I guess there's microbes in your breath. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe those aren't the ones you want in your sourdough. I don't know. Um, and but you can taste a difference, right? Uh, sure. I tell myself <laughs> that. I mean, it's 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 an old sourdough. Um, I got it from Betty Janone. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. it's been in my possession for like four or five years now. Um, okay. So before we start, oh, this is not rendering the same. All right. Well, that should be one line. It doesn't really matter, but I'm going to talk about the brief history of FIPI. Um, so uh, as Matt mentioned, we've kind of, um, we were in the Kubernetes space fairly early on. And so one of the things that, um, that kind of kicked off this whole effort was we were at a team offsite um, in Boulder in like fall of 2015, and Matt, you should really be the one to tell the story. <laughs> you didn't tell it. I'll tell the first part. You yeah. pick up the second part. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so the company uh, Deus, uh, Engine Yard, it was part of Engine Yard at the time. Engine Yard, you know, really well known for their work in the Ruby on Rails uh, community. And we had just discovered Kubernetes. We were writing a, a platform as a service, and uh, Kubernetes was looking at like a really compelling orchestrator. And my team was the R and D team. And so the CTO of Deus comes to me and he says, so I'd like you to introduce Kubernetes to the whole team at our offsite. And I said, so like the engineers working on the Rails stuff and the other, and he said, yeah, yeah. And also marketing and finance. And I'm going, what? <laughs> Explain Kubernetes to finance and marketing too? Uh, and he says, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I got you the lunch, the after lunch spot. <laughs> And I'm going, wait, but so, so not only is it going to be hard for them, they're all going to fall asleep. So I went home 
and uh, took some of my kids' stuffed animals, a giraffe, a gopher go that, I, that my daughter had gotten at the first go-con, go, go gopher-con, uh, you know, a zebra. Well, I guess it wasn't the zebra then. It was the giraffe, the gopher, the whale, stuff like that. Took pictures of them and the owl, and, uh, and then wrote this really, really cheesy PowerPoint slide deck that I happened to call the Illustrated Children's Guide to Kubernetes, even though there was no illustration. It was just silly pictures <laughs> of my kids' stuffed animals. Karen was in the audience. Um, yeah, so I mean, we kind of basically took that and made it into something nice and packaged into this Illustrated Children's Guide. Um, and that was where this all started. So I think we started kind of passing these out at conferences super early on. Um, it didn't really get picked up until later on. Um, and, okay, and I'll just jump into this. So um, it started eventually like picking up traction. And then, you know, at that point, we also had just gotten acquired by Microsoft in 2017. And so um, Dan Kahn, who used to be the executive director of CNCF, actually came to us around that time and asked if we would consider donating the assets to CNCF. Um, and so we did. And in celebration of that donation, we released a second book, which is Fibi Goes to the Zoo. Um, and um, as part of that donation, what we did was really release all the assets under Creative Commons so that anyone in the community can use these characters as mascots or tell their own stories. Um, so the second book is kind of an expansion of the first book with newer concepts. And we um, tell it in the, in the environment of a zoo, kind of explaining like, the di different varieties of Kubernetes concepts. Um, and then, sorry, we've done a lot of these. So this is the third book. <laughs> um, and this one is called From Double, Double O Kates with Love. I can't say it ever. Um, and we worked on this one with our colleague Lockley, Locky, or Lachlan um, Evanson, who uh, was on our team when we were at Microsoft, and this one is a spy theme story focused on um, secure supply chain is very popular as we were kicking off in 2019, as it still is, um, and they all kind of assume different spy characters, and they go on a secret mission. I think there's an Easter egg on every page of that one there related is. to either something cloud native or something spy. Some spy Kubernetes memes here yeah. and there. Yeah, yeah. Go, go look that up. Um, Oh, I don't know why our slides aren't rendering correctly. OK, anyway, I'm going to keep going. OK, so um, like I said, all of this is donated to the CNCF. So you might have seen these mascots around um, at KubeCon at the CNCF booth in the spon sponsor hall. Um, and like I said, um, all this is under Creative Commons. So there have been a lot of different community members who've gone on to do their own stories. There's a Prometheus one, a Pirate Adventure one, um, Cloud Native Transformation. There's recently uh, one on AI. So if you go to fippy.io, that will take you to kind of the home page with all the different stories. And oh, I'm going to send ours in soon as well. Um, and so for today, we are going to talk about WebAssembly because it's a hot new topic and it can use some demystification. So um, we're going to do a reading and then um, we're going to talk a little bit more <laughs> about the concepts. There will further. be a technical component to this talk. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, cool. OK. All right. Uh, yeah. OK. So uh, oh, um, if you didn't know and you came in late, we have physical copies in the back um, if you want to follow along. My as the aspect ratio for these slides are wider than what was um, illustrated in a vertical book. So the book has kind of more details than what you'll see here. Um, yeah, OK. Oh. Oh, uh, you're going to read the title? We'll oh, skip reading. You saw the title. You, you saw the title. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's real good. To watch. It's almost like it's the last session. Of, yeah. <laughs> Hearing a knock, Z swings open the door and shouts, Aunt Fippy, Blossom the Wassum Possum is here. With an excited grin, Blossom asks if everyone's ready for the big camping trip. As they get ready to load their camping gear, Blossom takes on the task of packing everything efficiently into the trailer. Z tries to pack a lamp, but Blossom explains, let's not bring things we don't really want or want, or sorry, let's not bring things we can't use. The trailer can, should only contain things that we need. WebAssembly, or WASM for short, is a binary format for applications. Like how Blossom's trailer holds any kind of supplies, it can contain any kind of program. Driving up the winding switchback mountain roads, Fippy notices something familiar. Look at all those cars. They're so different, but all the trailers are the same. 
Blossom nods and responds, indeed, the, this trailer is standardized. Any car can tow it. A trailer hitch can be attached to lots of different cars. Similarly, WebAssembly can run on many different operating systems, including Windows, Linux, and Mac OS, as well as many different system architectures, such as Intel and ARM. Noticing Fippy and Z's rather bare hooves, Blossom hands each of them a pair of hiking shoes. She explains, these will keep your feet dry, provide good traction, and give ankle support so that you're set for any environment. Z passionately shouts, red, my favorite color. WebAssembly was originally designed for the browser. However, like a good pair of hiking shoes, Wasm is versatile. It's not uncommon to find WebAssembly in serverless, plugins, embedded, and even in cloud environments. Struggling to set up their luxurious family-sized tent, Fippy grumbles, why is this taking so long? Blossom re reacts with a chuckle and tells Fippy, you don't actually need a big tent. A small one is faster to set up and can be perfectly sufficient. Like Blossom's tent, Wasm is fast to get going. While containers may take seconds to start, a WebAssembly binary can start in under a millisecond. Wasm's low resource usage makes these binaries lighter and more portable as well. During dinner prep, Z notices Blossom gathering rocks into a circle and is unsure what's going on. As she starts arranging the firewood, Blossom explains, I'm building a fire pit. Fires can be dangerous and they need to be contained. Only you can prevent forest fires. WebAssembly's security sandbox isolates code from the host and from other WebAssembly binaries. Like the fire pit, even if something bad happens inside, the danger doesn't escape. As the trio settles down to eat, Z drops her knife and sighs. Looking just as overwhelmed herself, Fippy asks Blossom, how do you deal with having to hold so many things at once? Hanging onto a branch, Blossom ca casually responds with, well, I've got everything I need in my multi-tool. The WebAssembly runtime can execute many different languages such as Rust, Go, JavaScript, C, and Python. Like a multi-tool, it's a versatile tool. After dinner, Z is craving dessert and notices a chocolate bar on the log. Seeing the longing in Z's eyes, Blossom offers a s'more. Would you like to build your own? You take a roasted marshmallow and sandwich it between chocolate and graham crackers. It's so much better when you can take three things you like and make them into one thing you love. The WebAssembly component model allows WASM binaries to communicate with each other. For example, you can use a Python library from JavaScript. Like a s'more, you can compose an application from different kinds of components. As evening falls, some familiar friends from the campsite up show up with a guitar. <laughs> Captain Cube looks on eagerly and asks, care to join us for a campfire sing-along? Z enthusiastically jumps up and requests, can we do everything is awesome? <laughs> so, yeah, it's hard to recover after that one, sorry. <laughs> uh, serverless WebAssembly functions are blazingly fast, uh, but they're not designed to replace virtual machines or containers. Uh, rather, the three together provide a breadth of functionality for creating different cloud services. Tired from their adventures throughout the day, they settle into their respective tents for the night. Z tries to doze off, but all she can think to herself is, how can someone so small snore that loudly? The end. Uh, for, the, for the back cover of this book, we also wanted to kind of, we wanted to draw from one of the original inspirations. Uh, Y'all have probably seen the current version of the cloud native roadmap, which is like a Mahjong set of little tiles with all kinds of different things on it. But the original one looked more like this. Uh, and so we wanted to take kind of that, that view and draw in the heritage with like, uh, of the trail map, but with the kind of like virtual machine campsite, the container campsite, and the WebAssembly campsite to illustrate the fact that these are all uh, pieces of a bigger cloud native ecosystem. So let's dive in now a little bit to the technical details that are sort of beyond the scope of the book. Uh, for us, this is what got us started on WebAssembly. 
Uh, you know, uh, like I mentioned in the, in the intro, uh, I worked on OpenStack, I worked on Kubernetes and containers, and now on WebAssembly. But to me, this is one long story. You know, long ago, we had every server was a piece of metal that ran a single copy of an operating system. There's a one-to-one -one relationship to this. In fact, so tightly were those terms used together that we used the term server to mean the hardware and the software. But at some point, it became the case that virtual machines provided a way for us to run multiple operating systems on a single piece of hardware, and it didn't take long for this upstart bookstore to you know, kind of outgrow its roots and start selling its, uh, its extra compute service to other people in the form of AWS, right? And so we saw the birth of cloud sort of uh, co-arise with this idea that there was a breakdown between the one-to-one -on -one -to -one relationship between hardware and operating system, and now we could have a many-to-one relationship. Now, virtual machines are a tremendously powerful tool, right? Underneath most of the cloud services that are running out there are virtual machines doing the heavy lifting. They're kind of the workhorse of the cloud. But we know that the image sizes tend to be very large. The startup times tend to be fairly long, and oftentimes in the order of minutes, right? And the tools to build those kinds of images are really designed more for, uh, for operations teams, for DevOps, and for platform engineers than for developers. So I, as a developer, uh, worked on a system where we deployed using virtual machines as our container, as our, as our um, uh, delivery artifact, and it was a very difficult process for us, right? It was a frustrating thing to have to actually manage the entire operating system when all I really cared about was my one daemon process. So when containers came around, and Docker you know, went from a, a small-time PaaS to a, to a platform tool, uh, I got really excited about that. Because instead of having to deal with the entire operating system, I was kind of just having to deal with a small wedge-shaped you know, pie slice of an operating system. I didn't need the kernel, didn't need the drivers, I just needed sort of the core OS utilities, uh, some of the file system, and then I could just drop my long-running daemon process, my server's process, into that Docker container and, and just manage that particular slice of the pie. So a third kind of way of using cloud compute also came out of what used to be a bookstore and what is now the biggest cloud provider, right? AWS invented this technology called Lambda. And the original idea of Lambda was they were trying to deal with the fact that they had excess time slices of, of the hardware that was running virtual machines and it might only be available for a little while, they wanted to see if they could actually load up those little slices of, of, of hardware too. And so they built the Lambda system, which sort of outgrew its original intent and is now a very popular serverless platform. Uh, but the idea of serverless is really that you're writing an event handler and uh, an event comes in and you start up something, you, run, you churn through the data, do whatever you do, send back a response and shut it down, right? So it's a very short-lived process. That is not amenable to the virtual machine or the container sort of startup life cycle, right? So in wave one of this kind of virtualization, you basically saw cloud, see cloud providers sort of pre-warming a bunch of bare virtual machine instances and then doing a last mile drop when the request comes in of the code base on it, trying to execute it. Some platforms shut it down, tear everything down and, and start over again. Others try and keep them warmed for a little while to handle a couple of requests and then tear them down. But it's a fairly inefficient compute mechanism. So we were looking at that problem uh, at the time we were at Microsoft in the, in the Azure team. And we were looking at this going, there's gotta be a better form of compute one that doesn't need to be pre-warmed, one that can start nearly instantly, execute that workload, exit, and free up all of its resources nearly instantly as well. So we were, and we wanted something that was very high density. So instead of taking a you know, big chunk of compute power and occupying it for some amount of time, often sitting idly, it was just using a small burst of it. And then we could start packing hundreds, maybe even thousands of these things per virtual machine or per host instance or whatever it was. That is the intuition that kind of led us to looking for a different kind of cloud computing. And the, the technology we ended up with, uh, which we are really, really excited about, is WebAssembly. WebAssembly was originally written for the browser, as the name implies. Uh, it, was, it was the nth attempt to make it possible to run a language other than JavaScript in the browser. 
right? There, was, there were Java applets, there was Silverlight, there was Flash, there were a number of things. But it arose in a very interesting way because it was created by a consortium from, uh, well, the Mozilla team really kind of got it going. But then Apple, Microsoft, and Google, the Chrome team, the Edge team, at the time the Edge team, and the Safari team all joined and they started working under the auspices of W3 to standardize this runtime. And they said, rather than do, we, do what we've done before, where everybody's tried to stake a proprietary claim in a language running in the browser, we'll build an open core for this, and then .NET can compile to this, uh, Python can compile to this, Rust can compile to this, and we'll be able to run all these different languages. So I, uh, I thought this story was mythical until KubeCon a couple of months ago. But there, and, and Ralph Squalachi from Microsoft was on stage with me and said, this is actually a true story. Uh, this, is a, this is a good example of what one of the use cases for WebAssembly was. How many of you have used the online version of Office? But Excel specifically? So I thought this was a myth, but the story I heard was there was this old library from the 1980s in core Excel. And when they started porting everything over to the browser, it became evident that somebody was going to have to port that library from C, written in the 1980s, to JavaScript. And the library is apparently very terse and difficult to work with, and nobody was quite sure how it worked. <laughs> um, and so they compiled it to WebAssembly. And then they could call in and out of that WebAssembly from the JavaScript runtime in the browser. So what you need if you're going to build an environment like this for the browser is you need a really good security sandbox because here you literally have a piece of code that nobody understands what it's doing. You don't want to give that, you know, carte blanche on your operating system or even on your JavaScript layer, right? So it had to have a really good security sandbox. Uh, it, it needed to be cross-platform and cross-architecture. Again, you know, C is notoriously one of those languages you compile to a particular target operating system, particular target architecture. But the goal of WebAssembly was to say, hey, we compile it once. Any place you're running that Office program, any place you're running Figma, whatever, uh, you are running those applications. So it has to be sort of like, once more, a realization of this write once run anywhere thing that Sun kind of introduced us to with Java in the beginning. Also, it needs to be fast. Uh, research suggests that users uh, unconsciously begin to feel uh, latency at somewhere around 100 milliseconds. So uh, there's actually some research that suggests it might be at the, at the sensitivity of 10 milliseconds, so literally blinks of eyes at this speed, right? Uh, if that's true, then you don't want a runtime that's going to be slow and is going to take things a while to get started. Right. Uh, in your Google uh, page speed rankings, it's sensitive to those levels of latency too. So if it takes more than 100 milliseconds time to first byte, you're going to get dinged a little bit in your, in your search ranking and that, I, I hear, stacks up over time. So in a technology like Lambda or Azure Functions or something like that, those technologies still, even though they're pre-warmed virtual machines and all of that, tend to have a 200 to 500 millisecond latency or greater. Uh, for a cold start. So you need something that's going to be way, way beneath that threshold if you want to build very high performance frontline services. So that's number three. Number four, you know, if this whole thing is going to work out better than Silverlight, Flash, all of those, you need to support multiple languages, right? And in fact, I think the only reason you got all four of the major browser vendors in the same room is because we went, yeah, bring your own language. We'll, we'll, we'll do our best to support everything. Also ends up being the scariest piece of WebAssembly because in order for WebAssembly itself to be successful, you have to have a whole bunch of language communities agree to follow the same specification and then implement a good, good version of that, right? So in the last couple of years, we've seen like Python and Ruby go. We've seen before that Rust, C, C++, um, a couple different JavaScript and TypeScript implementations. But all of those are dependent on the communities that support those languages to produce them. Uh, the Swift one's very interesting because it started out as a side community in the Apple Swift group, and now it's starting to work its way into the core Swift team. And th those are very exciting. Go actually happened the same way. OK, I belabored that point a little bit. But those were all virtues for the browser. So here we are looking for a really good serverless solution. And all of these things are aligning really well with the checkboxes we cared about checking off. If you're going to run in the cloud, you're going to run in a multi-tenant uh, environment, you've got to have a really good security sandbox. You really, really, really want that cross-platform thing, because one of the things that we continually heard was developers were frustrated in having to rebuild the same applications to run in ARM and Intel. 
And that was because the operations team was wanted to say, hey, ARM's cheaper right now. We want to use ARM. Oh, Intel is cheaper, has a different feature we want. We want to use that. And you don't want to take those operational things and push them back to your developer team in sort of highly interruptive ways. Same thing with, you know, we were at Microsoft again. Uh, being able to compile something on Windows, deploy it to Linux is a really, really nice feature. Docker still doesn't have a native implementation of Mac OS. Right, uh, so you're still you're still running a virtual machine to run Linux, so that you can run your containers inside of macOS. WebAssembly just runs natively on these platforms and many others. Right, that's a big virtue when you're building for the cloud because it means you can architect as an operational or platform engineering concern without having to bother the developers to learn a lot about your operational platform. Uh, and then, of course, fast execution, that was the core problem we were trying to solve, right? We wanted that sub-millisecond startup speed so that we could pack, you know, thousands of these WebAssembly applications on every node in your cloud environment. So we went from that and started building a tool that was a developer-oriented tool, all open source, designed to help people see how WebAssembly could be used in this serverless way. Uh, this was Spin. Spin, we released it at Open Source Summit. I think that was when we released it, yeah, uh, a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and already we're up to about 2.4.1 or 2.4.2, I think, is our, our current version of this. And uh, Spin just makes it easy to run a couple of commands, Spin New, Spin Build, uh, Spin Deploy, and, uh, you know, scaffold out something, work on it, compile it into WebAssembly, deploy it. Uh, our kind of core user story for Spin that first year and a half was, as a developer, I can go from a blinking cursor to a deployed application in two minutes or less. Uh, Radu, who's our CTO, would say, and we got it down to 66 seconds. Uh, and that was kind of what we were going for. If we could streamline that process, it makes it a lot more palatable for a developer to say, hey, I've got a Friday afternoon. I want to learn something new. Oh, I can do this and try it out and go, oh, yeah, yeah, this clicks with me. I like this. Uh, but we've taken Spin from that point on and started to build it into uh, more of an application framework uh, that provides a lot of access to WebAssembly's real feature set. And we'll come to that in just a moment. But before we go that direction, Spin Cube is another project we did, uh, released open source. This was in collaboration with Microsoft, SUSE, Liquid Reply, and others. Spin Cube is where you run your Spin applications if your primary platform for deployment is Kubernetes. So we built a system that could execute spin applications inside of Kubernetes to the point where uh, the WebAssembly workload runs side by side with container workloads. You can even run a single pod with uh, you know, a container and WebAssembly sidecars or a WebAssembly init container, which is not a container in that case, it's just a WebAssembly, and, and com containers in there as well, right? So we made it so that it follows all the abstractions of Kubernetes, and consequently, you can use all the things you're normally used to using for tooling, for analysis, for service meshes, for all of that kind of stuff. So that's the skin, spin cube project, and that's the one that we released just a few weeks ago. Um, we recently contributed that to CNCF, uh, so we're hoping that that becomes an official CNCF uh, sandbox project very soon now. So I thought I'd show just a really quick uh, illustration of what a serverless function looks like. This one actually uses our LLM service um, because AI, uh, but you know, what you see here is basically, and this is TypeScript if you're not familiar with the language, uh, so I'll read that function in, in regular <laughs> non-TypeScripty. We've got a function, an exported function called handle request. It takes a request and it returns a response. So again, serverless style. And when I say serverless, by the way, I, what are, what's the server we're doing without in this case? It's we are doing without the process of standing up a daemon process that listens on a port and answers request after request. Instead, this function gets fired. A request comes in. Uh, this function is executed. Uh, it does its work in here, in this case, inferencing on an LLM. And then it returns back a, a, an HTTP object with some body code and a 200 OK status response, right? Uh, so in between here, we're pulling in the Llama 2 chat model. We are asking it to pretend to be a Monty Python character and explain how to walk. You know, it's an obvious play on the silly walk, uh, a famous silly walk thing. And then we're running an LLM inference there on line number seven. So all we're really trying to convey here is this is a nice, compact piece of code. 
There's no process management, no network and socket management. We can accomplish a lot without having to introduce um, you know, threading or, or true asynchronous. I mean, we've got this annotated as async, but uh, that's the runtime that's doing all of that, right? We're not actually doing any of the, the uh, threading ourselves. So this makes it a very easy way to write and execute applications. Uh, there's, some, there's a really good book called The Value Flywheel Effect, which I don't know why it was called The Value Flywheel Effect. I feel like it really should have been called Why Every Organization Should Do Serverless, uh, because they, they dive into a bunch of use cases on how building using this particular model gives you a very, very efficient code base that requires less development time, smaller surface to do your testing on, and ends up having some really good operational um, um, features as well. So Value Flywheel Effect is a good book. OK, up to this point, I've been talking about how WebAssembly can address a problem that we already understand and have known that we needed to solve for a while. WebAssembly has a really interesting additive feature, and this is something that our team has been working on since about 2018, along with a bunch of other people, again, under the auspices of W3 and this, uh, this organization called Bytecode Alliance that uh, Karen will talk about in a few minutes. The component model allows you to take two WebAssembly binaries and say, this one exports a function, this one imports a function that matches this function's signature so they can talk back and forth to each other. So it's basically composition like you'd expect in libraries, except instead of going source code to source code, compiling this into one binary, as you would do in Rust or, or in JavaScript, tossing both of them in the same interpreter, you're actually running two web assemblies in two different security sandboxes and letting them talk back and forth. So it's sort of like, on one hand, uh, you know, uh, shared objects with a lot more security, or on the other hand, you know, something like gRPC or other RPC formats, but without needing the network latency, without needing the marshalling and unmarshalling, everything is done through the native type system. What you can do with that then is you can begin to build code bases that use libraries from different languages. You got your favorite Python library, you can suddenly use it from Rust without having to write any gnarly code that's unsafe or anything like that. You just import those functions, right? Uh, same, you know, you got some JavaScript code, you, you really need that left pad library in your, in your Go code, uh, you know, you can import left pad. And, uh, so that's kind of the first step you get with a component model, is this ability to begin composing things without necessarily needing to even know what the source language of this library is. Now, when you think about how many times we have written a YAML parser in many different languages, a JSON parser in many different languages, a date parser in many different languages, right? Now, suddenly, we have this opportunity to say, all right, the reference implementation can, can, or the optimized implementation, we really can start using it from everywhere. And that means that we have less code to maintain, smaller attack surfaces for all of this code that we have to maintain, uh, and just start to build a better developer experience and spend our time doing other things that we would like to do, right? Uh, the other advantage that you get here, though, that is probably not as evident, is that if each of these is running in its own security sandbox, we can start layering security policies per component. So for example, my YAML parser should never be able to contact the internet. Why would I need it to do that? So I can turn off internet. There was something like there was a compression library recently that did some dastardly things uh, with uh, the open SSH binary. Well, how did that attack work? It worked because they were both compiled into the same artifact, and this one could access functions in, in other libraries that it shouldn't have ever been able to access. Well, in the component model, this one, XZ, we'll call it XZ. Imagine you have a library called XZ and another one called SSH, right? <laughs> XZ can really only access the functions in SSH that SSH exports, and only if XZ imported them, and then your static and analysis tool, any of your analysis tools are going to go, okay, well, there's a strong relationship between these two. Should it be there, right? And you would be able to turn on and off various permissions. So this will change the way over time that we begin to build security around these things. And in many of these ways, it can be automa automa automated with tooling, and the developer won't necessarily have to do a lot of uh, you know, sit forward thinking about which components need which permissions. We'll be able to kind of infer this and then build tooling that will help us do all of this. I'm going way, way longer than, <laughs> than I should. But there's a lot there to unpack. And I think the exciting thing is we see WebAssembly as a technology that's going to solve a particular problem we have with the serverless uh, cloud computing. But we also see things like the component model as a really promising way to move forward. 
Okay, cool. Um, we have five minutes, so I, I might go through this quickly. Um, so I just wanted to touch a little bit about the WebAssembly ecosystem, if anyone's interested in getting involved. Um, so there's kind of three different community spaces. Matt had mentioned the W3C earlier. That is the World Wide Web Consortium. And they handle the standards for the browser and the web, um, and WebAssembly is one of the standards. Um, next is the Bytecode Alliance, also known as the BA. Um, and this group is comprised of working groups and reference implementations for WASM beyond the browser. And then obviously um, CNCF, which is the Cloud Computing, sorry, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And um, CNCF does, uh, they host a lot of conferences around WebAssembly. There was Cloud Native WASM Day. Um, that was a colo event with KubeCon just a, you know, about a month ago. Um, and then there's also WASMCon coming up later in June. Um, and then also, you know, they help host some of the um, WebAssembly projects um, that we've mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, and then if you're interested in staying connected um, and you wanna get started with WebAssembly and SPIN, there's, oh, so, sorry, I'm clicking the wrong slide. Okay, um, there's a QR code. Um, and then if you just have general questions about WebAssembly, we have a Discord. Um, a lot of our engineers hang out there and we're kind of just actively watching all the time. So if you wanna come hang out with us, ask questions, um, you can find us there. And that is our talk. Oh, still pressing the wrong slide. Okay, um, <laughs> cool. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, we have a few minutes for questions if anyone has any. I know any. we're standing between people and dinner, but if you have questions. <laughs> we would, yep. And uh, do we want to do the microphone thing? We'll try doing the microphone thing for the sake of video. Kate, do you mind? Uh, yeah, that one. Test. Yep. yep. Go. Uh, could you compare real quick uh, spin to, let's say, JVM? Oh, yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, so the question was, uh, can we compare spin to something like the JVM? Uh, so the J JVM introduced in the in the mid '90s. Uh, originally, and, and it's interesting because it parallels a lot of WebAssembly, right? It was originally designed to run embedded systems, to run in embedded systems. Uh, the Oak language was for, uh, and then of course Java took off because of its enterprise applications. You know, kind of outgrew its original original intent, uh, in the same way that I think WebAssembly has. But the JVM was based on the, had the same core idea, right? We should have a, a bytecode format that Java can compile to. And then it can execute on any particular platform. Again, when the embedded space, the idea was you have a variety of different small devices. You want any operating system and hardware profile to be able to support Java. Uh, so very much, and if you were to ask uh, Luke Wagner, the guy who created WebAssembly, in fact, I have asked him this question, he would say, Java is what inspired a lot of WebAssembly. Uh, so he took the, the, the sort of high-level view that Java, .NET, and other bytecode-based uh, languages did and said, okay, if we were to run it in the browser, we need a very different security model, right? We need a deny-by-default capabilities-based security model. Uh, Java and, and .NET are basically allow-by-default, but also have some capabilities tuning. You can, you can get them to, to that kind of level. But we also want a stack-based virtual machine so that we want one that's very language-neutral. I think it was Eduardo Vaci, I think it was, wrote this article about all the differences at a low level between the JVM and the WebAssembly uh, uh, instruction set and why they make a difference as far as execution speed and the kinds of languages that you can do. But basically, Java was intended to be a single-purpose bytecode language for just the Java language, and it's been sort of expanded out a little bit. But there's a reason why you can't compile Rust to Java or you can't compile uh, JavaScript to Java terribly efficiently, and, and that is mainly because there are some low-level differences in the bytecode format. Uh, but the way Luke talks about it, he says, you know, essentially you had 20 years of research go into Java and into .NET and other academic languages in the same vein about how to optimize, how to speed things up, uh, how to do JIT compiling, then how to do AOT compiling. And he was like, we got to start where all of these languages have, have accrued 20 years of technical debt and we could start over again and say, okay, what if we built with JIT and AOT in mind at the very beginning? What if we built with hyperportability and, uh, and a really strong sandbox model uh, from the beginning? And that, that's the way he tends to answer that question. Uh, but again, I'll, 
I'll try and find that article for you, but there's a, a really good technical article where someone really kind of dives into the details. Uh, but I think it is fair to look at this as in the same class of languages, or language run bytecode formats, as JVM and the, and the .NET runtime. In the previous slide, uh, Amazon is missing. Do you know about Amazon's uh, reaction, approach to WASM? This is not exhaustive, <laughs> sorry. It is, it is yeah. not exhaustive. Yeah. I don't know what Amazon is doing with WebAssembly. I, I here and there talk to a few people who I know are doing something, but I haven't, haven't heard much from, from them about specifically what they're doing. Uh, they are part, part of the Bytecode Alliance, but they are not as active in it as, say, Microsoft, who shows up to every meeting, has a number of people working on the specifications. Uh, Nginx is another good example of a company that uh, they have released WebAssembly support in Nginx unit. They're very open about what their roadmap is, uh, and we'll tell you, and you know, they added spin support to their application runtime a couple of, well, actually a couple of weeks ago. Amazon's doing something, I just don't know what, uh, and they haven't been really open with it in, in sort of like the standard bodies. If anybody knows, tell me. I'd love the gossip. Uh, so Google does a ton with WebAssembly itself. They gave a talk at Wasmio, which is a big WebAssembly conference in Spain, uh, about a month ago, where they talked about all the different things they're doing with it. The vast majority of them are all still on the Chrome side, right? So it's all in browser. Uh, we talked to them quite a bit in the Google Cloud side, um, and and I think it's it's catching on there too. Um, I'm, I'm curious. I, there are a couple people from Google who are probably going to be like, "Don't call me out from the stage," but uh, you know, it, it has been. We've had really, really great conversations with Google about different things that can be done there. In cloud, I think a lot of us are sort of converging on the idea that right now, uh, WebAssembly inside of Kubernetes is a really good place, has a really good pairing of technologies, right? Because Kubernetes provides this great orchestration layer. And then you can just drop WebAssembly right into that existing runtime and not necessarily have to build a new service from the ground up. Uh, we also run inside of Nomad, which is HashiCorp scheduler. So Nomad, probably HashiCorp also belongs on this list because they've worked on this kind of thing too. Uh, but recently it's been Kubernetes that's gotten the most traction. Uh, I think this is probably the last question, unless it's a really short question. Or I have a really short answer. <laughs> All right, I hope this makes sense. I don't know a lot about this space, um, but I heard talk of like garbage collection in Wasm run times. So I was wondering if you could address that, like, <laughs> what it's good for, what are the hangups in implementing it? Uh, I am so glad I'm not a low level language person because again, the, the hardest thing, the biggest mountain that WebAssembly has to climb to be a successful technology is somehow we have to convince this litany of language developers who each have their own separate project that they should build compilers or runtimes or whatever to get that language running inside of WebAssembly. For some languages, it is not terribly hard. For C, for Rust, uh, uh, memory management is just a very low-level core feature that is fairly straightforward. There's not an active garbage collector, things like that. Uh, for other languages, uh, they've built with, a, they have different assumptions, particularly a lot of the languages that were built for JVM, where the JVM did the garbage collection. Those languages don't have a well established pattern other than call into the VM. So the Kotlin team has been working a lot on the garbage collector specification because they want to be able to compile Kotlin code directly to WebAssembly. That's a now, now in preview. Uh, and they too talked at Wasmio. Fantastic uh, coverage of what they were waiting for, why they were waiting for it. But the TLDR is, as you pointed out, WebAssembly being an open standard means that people can continue working on it. There is a proposal out there that is now well into the second stage and people are implementing it that would also implement uh, some levels of memory management, garbage collection, things like that, that would be exposed to the language runtime so that not everybody has to rewrite the garbage collector. Now, I have no strong opinions about this. But if you get a bunch of language designers in the room and ask them whether it's better to do it that way or whether every language should implement your own, uh, I, I, you should probably also bring boxing gloves. So I did provoke this and listen to some um, people who are a lot smarter than I am talk about the pros and cons. So everybody's waiting to see if a universal sort of standard way of doing this memory management ends up working out faster and better than having every language sort of lean into it and solve that problem on its own. Uh, but right now, most of them solve the problem on their own. Uh, so JavaScript, Python, Ruby, you compile the interpreter into WebAssembly, and then you embed the scripts 
Uh, actually, I'll tell you about how that works, because that felt like magic the first time I heard about it. So for a scripting language, you typically load the scripts. You start up the runtime, you load the scripts off of disk, feed the, or whatever the storage is, feed them into the interpreter, and, and then begin to execute them, right? Well, WebAssembly being sort of stack-based machine, you, it turns out that if you're careful about how you do this, you can start up the interpreter, feed in the scripts, and then freeze that whole thing as one single WebAssembly binary. So you don't, so your startup time gets a lot faster because you don't have to do the disk IO and you don't have to do the first parsing run of all of these files. So as, so there's this program called Wiser that's uh, in the Bytecode Alliance that allows you to do this with different languages. And so far we've played around with it in JavaScript and in Python, should work for Ruby and other languages like that. But that's a really cool example of how WebAssembly can start to do something that we haven't necessarily had an easy way to do before, simply in virtue of the way that kind of format works.